But tonight, it's all about Deb Spera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was, she, was, she, was, she was like a little nervous. I'm like, they're here to love you. They're here to love you. Don't forget that. Uh, Deb Sparrow was born in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and lives here in Los Angeles. She owns her own television company, One Two Punch Productions. Yes, yes. And has executive produced such shows as Criminal Minds and Army Wives. Her work has been published in Sixfold, Garden Gun, and LA Yoga Journal. Call Your Daughter Home is her first novel. She will be joined with uh, Channing Dungey. Yes. A vice president of original series at Netflix, uh, Dungey will be partnering with Cindy Holland in setting strategic directions, working with people like Shonda Rhimes, Kenya Barris, Michelle and Barack Obama. <laughs> so please welcome uh, Deb Spera and Channing Dungy. My one worry is that I'm going to cry. So if I cry, just bear with me. <laughs> you, will. If you cry, we'll love it. Yeah. <clears throat> a little lower. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's do this. <laughs> I was telling Deb, I, I flew in this morning from London, so if, if I end up reading my cards a little more than normal, that'll be why. Um, okay, so before we jump in, yeah. maybe you can talk a little bit about before... Yeah. Oh, the mic's not on? Can oh, you hear me? There hello, we hello. go. Okay, All we right. got to talk like this. All right, we're going to talk really close. <clears throat> or sing. Shall we do that? <clears throat> um, before we talk about the book, I wanted uh, you to share with people a little bit about what you were doing when we met, you know, how, what you've been doing professionally up until this point. Well, before I answer that, I just want to thank um, Skylight Bookstore because this is my favorite bookstore in Los Angeles. And, <laughs> and I think a thriving bookstore is, is an indication of a thriving community. So the work they do, do in this community is important. So I'm, I'm just a proponent of supporting an independent bookstore. So thank you, Skylight Books. And Channing, you um, uh, are someone that I love. You're a woman with a vision that I admire. I admire you as a wife and a mother and a teacher. And I'm just really honored that you came tonight. And all my friends, you guys, thank you for coming. <laughs> <clears throat> um, you know, I, uh, I uh, started in this business as a producer probably like 28 years ago. Uh, I've been an executive at Showtime Networks, um, and Showtime's here representing in the house. <laughs> um, and uh, after that, I went and ran the Mark Gordon Television Company where I uh, was for seven years and where I learned about producing series. And uh, then my, my daughter went away to college, and I admired her courage so much because she was going across the country um, my children are here tonight as well, and my husband, the roadie. Um, <clears throat> I admired her courage to go someplace she'd never been, to experience winters when she had never experienced a winter before. And I thought, well, if she has the courage to do that, then surely I've got the courage to step out on my own and actually attempt something I've always wanted to do, which was start my own company. And um, I did that with my dear friend Maria Grasso, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, yeah, and um, and. Um, so producing television is something that was, uh, was a joyful experience because I love story. Story is my passion, and I've had the wonderful benefit of working with incredible writers, many of whom are here tonight. So um, that's how I got here so far. Excellent. <clears throat> so how do you feel that your experience as an executive and as a producer prepared you for writing a novel? Well, you know, it, it, a lot of you were in this business, so our passion is story. We, I, I was an avid reader as a child. I read incessantly. Uh, I read, you know, in the summer times, anywhere between five and ten books a week. Uh, and working with writers, if somebody would have told me that when I was 12 years old, that I could work with writers and maybe even be one someday, I would have said, I wouldn't have believed it because I grew up in this place called Oklahoma, Kentucky, which if anybody knows it, it's the most redneck part of Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> Very redneck. And um, I, I, I just am, story is my thing. I mean, it's, it drives my life. It, it is a, a huge component in my successful marriage. Um, it's something I've always loved. And 
uh, I think being an executive producer and working so much, always, every day, in story, in story, in story, with writers, with books, with magazine articles, with ideas, is something that I've just been, in some ways, it's prepared me in more ways than I can imagine. Because being in television, you know, you think about character. Character is key in any good story. And for me, character is what drives any good story. Character informs, character drives plot for me. Plot doesn't drive character. So that has been something that's always been one of my favorite things uh, about storytelling. So there's a lot that has been said in the past about people who work as executives <coughs> and producers and in other support roles in the business of mm -hmm. uh, being shadow artists, right? <laughs> and I'm curious as to what finally inspired you to step out of the shadows and into the light, how you first got bit by the writing bug, and sort of what your first steps were on the journey to writing this novel. Well, about four years ago, I found myself at a crossroads. Um, I didn't have anything in production. Um, Maria had to depart from the company, and I was really looking at how do I, how do I keep myself in a creative spirit. Uh, so many people are here tonight who influenced this decision, so it's emotional. Um, I, um, I always wanted to write something. I always wanted to write a little something, and so I had this notion that I was gonna write a tiny little novella, and I was gonna check it off. It was gonna be like a bucket list check off. So I started studying at UCLA Extension, and I wanted to write five, I wanted to write a little novella. I wanted to write five short stories about five different generations of women from the same Southern family, because I really wanted to explore um, what it is we pass down from one generation to the next, both spoken and unspoken. So I wrote this little novella, and I thought, good, I'm done. And I had a teacher who said, okay, now send your work out. And I thought, okay, I'm a good student. I'll send my work out. And I started getting responses from literary journals. And I thought, well, uh, hmm, I don't know what to do here. But, um, so I called, uh, you know, when you work with writers all the time, I called my one literary friend at the time, Mark Bowden, who wrote Black Hawk Down. And I said, Mark, and I was doing a show with him at AMC, developing a show about his time as a cub reporter at uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I said, what do I do? You know, I don't know what to ask for. I don't know what, what. And he said, well, Deb, I don't know anything about literary fiction, so you need to call Morgan Entrican. He's my publisher and friend. And I said, I'm not calling Morgan Entrican. <laughs> if anyone knows, doesn't know him, he owns all of Groves Atlantic. <laughs> and I said, no way, I'm calling Morgan Entrican. And he said, well, you have to. He's expecting your call. I've told him all about you. <laughs> He's waiting. So I... I'm a good producer. I picked up the phone, and he answered the phone himself, and I, which nobody does in this town. And uh, he said, first of all, let me tell you, nobody's going to buy a novella, so nobody's going to publish it. And I said, that's fine. I don't care. I just, he, I just want to know what to do about these literary journals. He said, well, it sounds to me like you need an agent. And I said, no, I, I don't need an agent. I, I have a career over here. And he said, no, it sounds to me like you need an agent. Send me your work, I'll read it, but I'm not going to publish it because I don't. nobody's going to buy a novella. I said, that's fine, that's fine. So um, I sent him my work, and in a week, he read my work. And he called and he said, okay, I, I think you're talented. Um, I'm going to send you to four agents. Call them, tell them I sent you, and let's see what happens. So I, my heart was racing, so I, I, I sent inquiries out to these four agents. And in a couple weeks, one of them emailed me and said, I'm halfway through your novella. Don't do anything until you talk to me. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a, a jingle tomorrow. And I was like, that girl's from the South. <laughs> <laughs> so she called me the next day, and, uh, and I, was, I didn't know what to expect. And she said, I have to tell you, I love your work, but I don't think any of these are real short stories. I think they're all novels in disguise. And I would like you to start with the first story, and I would like you to expand it into a novel. And oh, by the way, I'd like to represent you. And then I cried for two straight weeks <laughs> on the couch like somebody shot my mother. <laughs> and my children would wander by the couch and look at me and, and roll their eyes and like, what's wrong with you? This is a good thing. So what I did was I finally conned myself. I, I, I pulled myself up off the couch and I said to myself, I gave myself permission every day to write badly, to fail, to suck. And... Uh, you know, I, I, 
I moaned and railed about it to my therapist, who's in the house tonight. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I began to go out on my back deck, and I told myself I only had to write for one hour every day. And I was going to write as badly as I could. I was going to write horribly. And so every, every day, I would walk out on the back deck, and for one hour, I would just write as badly as I could. And then I started to hear voices. <laughs> I started to hear the characters talking to me. And one hour led to two hours, and two hours led to three hours. And in five and a half months, I had a first draft. And in 10 and a half months, I had a rewrite of that draft. And before the year was finished, this remarkable agent, Duval Austin from Charleston, South Carolina, <laughs> sold my novel in auction with seven major publishing houses bidding. <laughs> so I think the key there is if you give yourself permission to fail, anything is possible. So that's how that happened. All right. <laughs> so let's talk more specifically about the book, okay. about Call Your Daughter Home. <clears throat> and I know that it was your own upbringing, and in particular, you yeah. were inspired by your great-grandmother, who, Mama Lane. Mama Lane and Mama. Mama, your grandmother, <laughs> that sparked your interest in 1924 South Carolina as the setting. Mm -hmm. And that particular time period, let's just talk a little bit about why, mm -hmm. what was so significant about 1924 South Carolina? Uh, in, uh, in the late... Uh, teens of the 20th century, all through about 1924, the South was plunged into a deep depression long before the depression that hit the rest of the country. And that's because the boll weevil infestation came through and decimated the cotton crop, which just created great despair throughout the South. And a lot of people starved to death. And my family was no stranger to those hardships. Um, when I was a child, um, well, my mom had me at 16. A lot of you know that. My, my dad was 19. And because my mother struggled with addiction and an unhappy marriage, I spent a lot of my time with my mamaw, who grew up in Branchville, South Carolina, where this book takes place. Tiny little town. I mean, itty bitty. You could throw a rock across it. And she had a morbid fear of worms. She, she thought they were caused by unsanitary conditions, which means until I was almost 11 years old, she would bathe me to make sure that I was clean. And she sat on this, in this tiny one bathroom as a little house for six kids, and she sat on this little tiny white wooden child's, wooden child's chair, and her ample bottom would be rolling over both sides, and her knees would be butted up against the commode, and she'd have a cigarette hanging out of the corner of her mouth, <laughs> prescribed by the doctor for nerves, I might add. <laughs> and she would scrub every ounce of dead skin off my entire body, and she would talk. That's when she would talk. And she, lo she cussed like nobody's business. She had two favorite cuss words, shit ass and dumb ass. And she usually <laughs> said them in refer reference to my grandfather. Um, but she talked about growing up in what she called desperate times. Uh, I learned that she lost her teeth due to malnutrition when she was a teenager. That when her father died unexpectedly, it, it decimated the family. They were starving, so her mother had to farm the children out to relatives in hopes that they would get something to eat. Um, I, I learned a lot about her life, and while she didn't, wasn't raised during this time, she was born in 1924, um, her spirit, her, the, her fortitude struck me. Her mother still lived in Branchville, South Carolina, so we would take road trips that summer to see Mama Lane, and Mama Lane lived on Freedom Road in this little clapboard house, and no running water, no pl indoor plumbing, with a, with a pump by the back door, so all your needs were, like your washing, your cleaning of your body, of your dishes, whatever, that pump provided. There was an outhouse, you know, she'd wring a chicken's neck. Everything went to use. Uh, if she had an old dress, she turned it into a dish rag or, um, or an apron. I have, I have like nine of her aprons. If any of you follow me on Instagram for years, you'll see those aprons yes. on friends of mine. Um, uh, and so those women, they're, they're incredible uh, ability to survive in such difficult and dire circumstances motivated me and inspired me. And I wanted to tell a story about that time. So I know when you started writing the book, you were hearing, of course, Mama Lane's voice and Mama's voice, but then over time, you started hearing the three voices of the women who narrate this story. Yes. Right. So there's Gertrude, mm -hmm. who is a mother of four and is in a very troubled marriage. And there's Retta, mm -hmm. who is a first-generation freed slave mm -hmm. who works as a housemaid in a plantation. 
And then there's Annie, who is the matriarch of the family that owns that plantation. So the question that I have for you is, which of those women came to you first? And who, who came live on the page at the beginning? Gertrude was first. Gertrude was, the first chapter of this book is that short story, uh, that first short story. Gertrude was a woman who, she lives in Polk Swamp with her husband. She has to make an unconscionable decision to... Uh, save her children from starvation or die at the hands of an abusive husband. And she does make an unconscionable decision. So she was first. And, and when Duval called me and said, I think this story is a novel, uh, Retta and Annie were in that story. And I immediately began to think about the disparity between these three women uh, from different classes, from different races. And I wanted to explore that disparity, but also explore what happens when three disparate women come together. And when three disparate women come together for a greater good, they're a dangerous force. And I wanted to explore that. Yeah. <laughs> Would you share with us a little bit of Gertrude's voice? Yes. Um, I'm just, all my, all my um, book friends said, uh, talk more and read less. So I'm just going to read tiny little passages. Uh, but this is the very opening of the book. And it's Gertrude. And when we meet her, uh, she's hunkered down in a swamp. Um, and here we go. Gertrude Pardee. It's easier to kill a man than a gator, but it takes the same kind of weight. You got to watch for the weakness and take your shot to the back of the head. This gator I'm watching is watching me too. She smells the last of my menstrual blood, so she's half in, half out of the water, laid up on the ridge of dry land that is our footpath through the swamp and out to the main road. I'm propped against an old cypress. We're a pair. I'm sick with pain. The hours of wait have made me stiff, but it don't matter. None of that matters. All that counts is this ridge laid out like a rope between us. This big old thing's got her back to the nest my girl Alma spotted earlier today. She's a 10-foot mama, big enough to feed us through fall. Got two shells in this gun, but only one chance for a kill. When we come to Reevesville, I was hoping to get Alvin straight, but it looks like he's going to run me crazy. Ever since the bull weevils took our crop, he ain't done nothing but drink for nigh on a year. We left everything we had in Branchville, including two of our four daughters, and come over here to his daddy's sawmill for work. I hope steady work and some food in our bellies might set him right, but he ain't right. Maybe he never will be. First, he closed the mill at 1 o'clock yesterday and didn't come home till late last night. Then he found the letter from my brother Burns telling me of a job over in Branchville. He hates Burns for taking care of what he can't. He wailed on me and warned me to stay put. He's still mad from the last time I went to see my brother for help. Now my eye is swole shut, I can't see out of it, and the only letter I've had for a month giving me the news about my two oldest children is burned and gone. Alvin laid in the bed all morning until his daddy come over here and raised hell. Now he's gone off to work, sick with drink, and we're left with nothing but the sound of our own bellies. I've about worked myself to death here, and it ain't done any good. I'm the woman of a house that don't exist. That's Gertrude. So I think what really struck me, and we've talked about this, is that each of these women, their voice is so rich and so distinct and so specific. Mm -hmm. And the book has a lot of heavy themes in it. I mean, obviously, we're dealing with people who are in extreme poverty. You know, the cotton crop has failed. Their, their way of life has been totally turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And yet there still is some humor, and there still is love. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really strikes me about Retta the, 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 the first generation freed slave is that despite everything that she has to deal with and contend with in her life, she brings a sense of humor and she brings a real joy. And I don't know, I just would love it if you would share a, a, a part of Retta's point of view because yeah. I think that everyone should hear a little bit about how she sees the world. Retta, um, Retta is a first generation free slave and she also works for the family that owned her family. And um, she's married to the love of her life. And she and her husband started this community called Shake Rag. Uh, it's a black community in Branchville. It still exists. And um, this is a passage where she talks about uh, when she first met Odell. Oh, okay. Hold on, I got to find it. Oh, I was the first of my kin to move away from the plantation and take up property here on Hunter Lane. After Mama died, none of us belonged on that place no more. That time was gone, and we needed to move along with it. 
Pretty soon, everybody got to moving over near us, and quick as we could turn around, there were nine decent houses nestled back in the woods with 22 children running around, everybody raising a family except me and Odell. Each year that went along with no child weighed on us, but we kept on. Odell would be up before dawn, and I'd have his saucer of coffee and biscuits waiting before he headed to the railroad station. He'd spend the day shoveling coal as a fireman for the trains that run from Branchville to Columbia and back. He was a big, strong man, worked physical labor 16 hours a day, longer right before he was hurt. After he'd leave, I'd join the women folk along the lane, heading out to do the white ladies' cleaning and wash. Every colored woman on the street had a job washing and cleaning for white folk. Shaking rags was what we called it. Got so everybody in town started calling our neighborhood shake rag. It stuck. Odell and me married after Mama died. We was writing letters the whole fall before she passed while he worked on the railroad over in Williston. That summer, his mama come over and asked me and mama to write Odell, said he was down in the mouth and homesick as could be. So I wrote, and he wrote me back. We told each other a little something about every day, just news around town, nothing more. One letter he wrote me said, Dear Oretta, oh, 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 how I love the letter O. Your friend, Odell. <laughs> then one day, shortly thereafter, he surprised us all and come up come home for a family dinner on a Sunday afternoon. It was a pretty day. The leaves was just dipping into the candy colors they changed to before they let go of their branch. It was a party with everybody bringing something to add to the table. After we, he ate, after we ate, he stood up and said to Mama, Miss Sally, I aim to marry Retta. I took off work for two days so we could get it done tomorrow. <laughs> Mama turned and looked at me and my blood ran so hot I jumped out of my chair and said, No, you ain't marrying me tomorrow, Odell Boodles. That ain't how it's done. Well, how's it done then, he asked. You got to ask me first. <laughs> you know I love you. No, I do not know that. Well, I write you every day, don't I? And that's when it come on me that I loved him too. But I couldn't say so with all them eyes on me, even though now I suppose they all saw it in me even before I did. I said yes, finally, but I told him he needed to put in work on the Branchville line. I wasn't raising my babies away from family. Said when he got that done, we'd marry. Afterward, Mama said to me, child, you might have missed your boat. But I knew Odell in the heart, and he knew me the same way. He wanted what I did. That's read it. <clears throat> I love that. I love the oh, 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 how I love it. Every time it just. That, I have to give credit where credit's due. Um, my roommate from college is here, and her little girl in kindergarten wrote a poem that said, oh, 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 how I love the letter O. Oh. So where's Chloe? She's there, she is. <laughs> I thought that was priceless, so. It was great. It was great. You want some water? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. So if Gertrude brings sort of the grit and the stubbornness and the determination and Retta brings hope and optimism and finds joy in the hardship, it feels like Annie is the person that brings the biggest perspective. Mm. She is the oldest of the three women, <clears throat> and she's sort of, she's, she's experienced all of it. She remembers the prosperity. She knows the hardship, and she brings a real clarity to mm. the circumstances. And I think what's interesting, interesting for Annie is that she, over the course of this book, has a very, she, she, she understood her life to be a certain way, and then events transpire that make her see a completely different picture than the one she thought she'd had. And right. so that's actually a really big transformation for the character. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Annie's voice is that one that does give you the opportunity to sort of see the whole landscape for what it is. Yeah. Annie was raised in a wealthy family herself. She married into wealth, but she already had an enormous amount of wealth herself. So she's, she's traveled the world. Um, and for me, Annie is the most blind of our characters until she isn't anymore. And Annie grew up without a mother. And Gertrude and Retta had mothers. And Gertrude and Retta also have faith. And Annie has none. She doesn't believe in God. She think it's, thinks it's a fool's errand. And so I wanted to explore a woman who's blind, who suddenly is made to see, and then see what she's capable of. And she told me. So this little passage is Annie. Um, her husband is a, a very powerful man in the region, not just in the town. He's, he helps get governors elected. He has a lot of political sway. And because the boll weevil infestation has been so bad for so long, he's decided to grow tobacco because insects hate tobacco. And tobacco, he feels if he, if he has a successful harvest, he can um, recoup his losses. So he uh, is off to market with her sons. And uh, Annie is left alone in the house for the first time ever. Annie is the mother of five children. One of her sons committed suicide when he was just 12 years old. She doesn't know why. And she is estranged from her two 
adult daughters and she's been estranged for 15 years. And she is a little confused about why they're estranged. So this passage um, is Annie alone in the house for the first time. And her, her son, her 12-year-old, when he committed suicide, he did it in the barn. So this is Annie. I am wide awake. Well past the midnight hour, I lie in my bed clutching the blankets despite the heat. I need them to hold me down. Otherwise, I might float out the window and into the night sky. I know what I am bound to do before I rise, though my actions will do no good, offer no comfort. I've had a full weekend of so little rest, every waking moment feels like a dream. Reason has left me. No matter how I try to resist, in my darkest days, the barn always beckons, and I'm compelled to face again and again the thing I hate. I've lost count of how often I've wandered alone to that dreaded building in hopes of a single clue, a morsel of understanding. For the first month after Buck died, I slept there every night, despite Edwin's protests. I asked Edwin to add electricity to the barn when we put it in the house, but he refused, worried my request might reignite my ritual. In one small hour of one insignificant day, everything I held dear was destroyed. I wasn't a good mother. That much is fact. But I was the only kind I knew how to be. This morning, the men took leave, and the relief I felt has been replaced by deep discontent. Over and over, back and forth, my brain plays Buck's death and the incessant fights with my daughters. Over and over, I look for a scrap of knowledge to understand what went wrong. Nothing good can come of my imaginings, of what might have been. I wrap a blanket around my shoulders and walk like a nomad through the desert of my own home. I visit the boy's bedroom and sit on the bed where Lonnie just last night slept. His scent lingers on the pillow. My memory of him and Eddie as boys has faded so significantly I doubt I was ever witness. There is a time and place for memories, and old age is where they often come to reside. I used to gather them one after another thinking, I won't forget, I won't forget. But it is the details that leave first, and in their wake is only the one big moment. Maybe it's a year or five years, maybe a day, some terrible day. But beyond that, all the details fade. What's left is a wave so big it smothers. Children are such a wave, the birthing and caring and rearing. When you're in the throes, it all seems interminable. Then whoosh, it's over. I don't know why I was surprised when the children grew up, but I was. I thought in their youth it would last forever. Now I see that it was my youth, not theirs, that was speaking. The past is now, and now, and now. And that's Annie. <laughs> so the original title of the novel was Alligator. Yes. And that stemmed from that <coughs> short story, which became the first chapter that you read a little bit from, where mm -hmm. Gertrude talks to us about how it is to hunt a gator. Right. Right. And now, Call Your Daughter Home. So that is a title that it speaks to me <coughs> as a mother and a daughter, and especially for me reading the book for a second time it resonated even more deeply than before because there's a chapter in the book that Retta narrates where it very specifically speaks to call your daughter home. Mm -hmm. But because the story is so much about mothers and daughters and the relationships that they have with one another and the legacies that we leave, and I'm just curious sort of how the <coughs> title came to you and what it signifies for you. Well, I wanted to call it Alligator and my publisher said no. <laughs> <laughs> they said that if people Googled it, it would be, they would, go, they would find Florida and children's books and it wouldn't stand out in the market. So they said, you have to change the name. And um, I, I wrestled with it. I was actually on a location scout with my friend Eileen uh, that we did something together last summer and I, I said, they want me to change the name. And I was so upset, I couldn't figure it out and they sent me a bunch of ideas that I just, I just hated. And, um, and I called my agent one night on this location scout and I said, tell him I'll give him the money back. I don't, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> and she said, we're not giving that fucking money back. <laughs> You can do this. So I finally just remembered that when I read a book, I almost always find the theme of the book in the heart of the book, in the center of the book. So I just opened it to the middle, and I found this chapter with Retta. And it's, I, I can't tell you what it's about because it'll spoil it, but um, in it was the phrase, call your daughter home, call her home. 
um, and she's, it's a birthing scene, and she's telling the mother, you know, your child is at the gate. Call, call her, call your child home. Call your, call your child home. And, um, and I was like, oh, that's it. Call your daughter home. It resonates with Annie and her two daughters that she's estranged from. It resonates with Gertrude and all four of her daughters, particularly Lily, uh, whom she struggles with. And it resonates with Retta, who lost a child. Um, and so I really wanted to explore the dynamic, the ferocity of motherhood. Uh, we've all been children, and some of us are parents, but we all understand the ferocity of that kind of deep love. And so that in the center of the book was just, it, for me, I, I like the title better than Alligator. So it was a, <laughs> thank God I didn't give the money back. <laughs> I, I, and Deb, we've talked about the book a lot, and I've said to you before that I, I wasn't at all surprised that you would be able to, to create a great narrative, that there would be plot twists and surprises, and there are. There are definitely things in this book that I certainly on first read did not see coming. But what struck me the first time I read it, and even more so on the second read, is just how poetic the visuals are and mm. how richly you bring to life this, this time period and all the different aspects of it, mm. you know, both the sort of high-end... Uh, splendor of the Coles plantation and then sort of the very simplicity of shake rag. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as to like the, the kind of research that you did mm. and how you immersed yourself in, in <laughs> learning about this time and then mm. bringing it to the page. Oh, it's so much fun. You know, I, I, I when you researching, researching a time or, or things that you love, it's just a joy, you know, to, to get in there and, and learn more. Like, how to cure worms in a child, you know, what is the old, what are the old wives tales about how to do that? Things like that. Just, just, I, I loved doing that. So, um, what was the first part of your question again? <laughs> I, just getting the visuals. Oh, and I know you traveled yeah. a little bit and you went and did Oh yeah. I did research trips in Branchville. My cousin, uh, Marsha, who grew up in Branchville, she took me all through and introduced me to people I hadn't met. I went to Canaan Baptist church. Vernon was the pastor there. And I, if you've never been to an all black Baptist church, I highly recommend it <laughs> because the call and response of that service, like I go there now every chance I get it. When I'm in Branchville, I'm going to church with Vernon. Um, because he would, I, I've never, I was transported during these services. He helped me with all the religious components, all the biblical components, all the sermons. Um, Marsha, my cousin, took me to St. George Revival Camp. Uh, it still exists. It's 250 years old. It's 99 what they call tents, but they're actually two-story cabins just butted up against each other in a circle with a tabernacle in the middle. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, this is where the climax of the whole story is taken. So I felt like, here's the weird thing. When you start giving yourself permission to fail and you actually start doing the same thing every day, it's like you walk through a veil. It's like everything you see and do is, is connected to what it is you're attempting. And I, I would go out on that deck and I, would, I knew every bird in my yard. I knew the hummingbirds. I knew the mockingbirds. There was one mockingbird. I'd whistle, and it would whistle me back the tune. My son would say, Mom, that bird is not talking to you. And I was like, <laughs> well, I will tell you, that bird came into my house three times in one month. And I, I caught it twice with my own bare hands. And I, I remember opening the back door to walk out on the deck one day, and that bird is standing right there on my deck. Weird things began to happen. And that was a result of just doing a deep dive into the research and listening to what began to happen. It's almost a mystical experience, for lack of a better... Writers in the room, you, well, any artist in the room, any artist understands that. Well, it's almost like when you think about Retta <laughs> in the book and she has the gift, right? Yeah. She can see things that are beyond <laughs> sort of what we can see. Yeah. And it feels like you were tapping in a little bit to that yourself. Well, I... Yeah. All these women are in me. I mean, I, I had a dream when I was six months pregnant with my second child, and... Um, I, I, in the dream, I saw this little fat baby in a diaper and I saw me, my face lean into what looked like a frame. I put my face up against the baby's face and I said to the baby, hello, my son. And I woke up and I should also add in the corner where there's this little tiny itty bitty tadpole fetus. And I, I, did, I for years, I didn't know what that was, but I woke up and I woke Rob up and I said, we're having a boy. Nick, 
And, <laughs> <clears throat> and then years later, after Rob and I decided, you know, we weren't going to have any more children, I, I got pregnant. And I was like, oh, that one has been waiting to come. You know, so that's I, all these things that I wrote about were not uh, strangers in my life. I just finally embrace them. Well, Deb, you are surrounded in this room by so many friends and hopefully quite a few fans. And I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that I am in awe of you and I am proud of you. Thank you. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing your voice and this remarkable story with us. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>